It, it is Tuesday. 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 <laughs> we are having a delirious day uh, in the best possible way. And, uh, and so welcome. Welcome to that delirium and to one of our favorite people, Mayumi Yoshida. Uh, this one is for our fellow third culture kids, our transnational kids, the people that have moved around. Actually, Raquel, for you, just even moving cities, moving schools, if you've felt like you haven't quite fit into one place and haven't quite fit into the other, uh, I want to thank the members of the audience and our lovely listeners and watchers and viewers and humans uh, who asked for this type of conversation and said it was really nice to feel heard when we heard this little snippet of not quite fitting one way or the other. And Mayumi is someone who recognizes the joy, the uniqueness in not uh, being born and raised in one single place, but also does this incredible job of embodying in everything she does in her career, this amazing commitment to community. And that doesn't have to be from the place that you are currently living and it you can tell extraordinarily rich stories with whatever your unique experience is and i think this really warmed our heart and raquel you had a this was your first meeting with with mayumi and i think you had a you had a, a love, lot of love heart eyes going on <laughs> yeah i absolutely loved her i also think this is a really transferable episode because we talked a lot about um, building yourself up, finding opportunities to learn, um, the importance of kind of setting yourself up in the best way so that you can show up as your truest, most authentic self. So yeah. um, bios, we talked about you grants, know, how you can grants, pitches, we talked about pitches mm -hmm. and, you know, how sometimes all of those awards and those things that can almost seem embarrassing for some people to talk about or they don't really want to talk about it. How selling yourself on the paper can sometimes give you the space to show up authentically as whatever kind of goofball you are. And that was definitely something that really sunk in for me. So mm. I hope that you enjoy this episode. I have no doubt you will. We also giggled our faces off uh, <laughs> throughout it. And I think that's just really important right now. You know, it's kind of like burnout city for a lot of people. And I think some laughter is important. So I hope you laugh along with us. Yeah. Or at us. I mean, whatever, how it, just laugh, like definitely for whatever at, reason. Definitely at us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Especially Raquel. Yeah. I get laughed at It was at an, a fun one. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy, BBs. Hello, my friends. That sounded super manic. Um, it is uh, a morning time for some of us. It is evening time for others. Raquel has a very strange bird that is outside. Well, it's not her bird. Um, some bird has, <laughs> is existing outside of her door and it's, it's highly annoying. Um, <laughs> but apart from that, we're doing okay, aren't we? Yeah? I don't mind the bird. I mean, okay, well, <laughs> just you'll hear it later. Um, but that's beside the point. The point is we are talking to one of my favorite human beings. One of those people oh. where, you know, when you meet someone and I was, we were just talking about this and we we're talking about how Raquel and I first met like kind of across the room at an event and we were like, oh, who's this badass? And I, I was like, I had exactly the same vibe when I first met Mayumi. It was like, we were sitting at a production table for, for two different, I think two or three different shows that we were kind of pitching. Um, for a, a local community um not competition but like a fund initiative i would say mm -hmm. and i was like who is this badass that's like dressed so well and then i did a little creeping and was like who is this person that's just doing all these amazing things this incredible actor incredible director uh, i think it was before you had done akashi which we'll get and speak to you about later um what did you do now see what did the bird fly into the room raquel what have you done <laughs> oh my god <laughs> What did you do? I didn't do anything. Uh, do you remember that 
fluffy chair that you were like, what kind of monster chair is that? I put a lamp on it and it had a mind of its own and, and it just... <laughs> it just fell. It, it just decided to fall. Yeah, see, this is going to be one of those, this is going to be one <laughs> so of those so days, isn't it? it? This creature I'm monster. I'm usually so much together, so much more together. <laughs> <laughs> I promise. <laughs> Raquel's, Raquel's normally oh normal. <laughs> it's not true. Everyone that's listening knows that it's not true. They, they know I found me. that out in the first five minutes. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, well, oh. now that the monster has finished, the bird has stopped talking. <clears throat> I'll lose my voice and then we'll continue. <laughs> <laughs> but this is not about us right now, okay? This is about Mayumi, my no, friend. <laughs> oh my gosh. And now my camera's out. Oh, there we go. Oh, we're having such a fun time. What is this is like, happening? it is art. This is art, real life. Okay, oh. let's talk about Mayumi though, because again, to finish my sentence, I was like, <laughs> sentence, story, thought, vibe. Um, there are some people that you meet and you get to follow their careers and you get to follow them as, as real badass people who are making big changes in the world. And because you're both running so fast at things, you really don't get a lot of time to intersect unless you intentionally start to create projects together, which I'm hoping that at some point we all get to do. Mm. Um, and this is the beginning of that. And I finally got to have coffee with Mayumi the other day and I was like, oh, you're just such an amazing human being. So by way of formal introduction, Mayumi was born in Japan, raised in three continents. Oh, I love a transnational kid, me. Uh, <laughs> Mayumi's the, uh, Mayumi is an uh, actor, a writer, director, based here in Vancouver, BC, also known as the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil tooth nations. Uh, her role as crown princess in The Man in the High Castle received a 2016 UBCP Actress Emerging Actor nomination. And... Uh, as an award-winning writer and director, Mayumi has been a leading force in emerging Asian Canadian cinema. We just saw each other at, at the Vancouver Asian Film Festival the other day, and it was uh, it was such a wonderful opening film and such a wonderful gala and event. Uh, Mayumi is an alumna of w the Women in Directors Chair Career Advancement Module, uh, Women in Focus Mentorship at Whistler Film Festival, and currently the participant of the inaugural Warner Media. Canadian Academy Access Writers Program, which I want to know so much more about. I know, Amazing. right? <laughs> oh, so just such an underachiever over here. Uh, <laughs> she, she recently was also selected to be part of TIFF, which is the Toronto International Film Festival's Netflix Talent Accelerator Fellowship mm -hmm. and the TIFF Writer Studio for 2022. She's currently working on her feature film version of Akashi. Um, is, it Aka is it Akashi mm -hmm. or Akashi? Akashi. Akashi. In Japanese, it'll be Akashi, but in English, you can say Akashi. Akashi. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and I am so excited to watch that short because it was a short film first, but you had always intended, I think, for it to be a feature at some point. I think that was, in, am I right in thinking that? Yeah, it was originally a play. So at the Fringe Festival, and then the short was sort of a, a sequel or like a part that I couldn't really write in the play. So oh. eventually I think the ultimate goal was to turn the play into a feature. But now I, I look at the two scripts and it's quite different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love <laughs> yeah. the evolution of, of story, right? When you, when you give birth to something, hypothetically speaking, and then you, and then you evolve it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so before we get into that, I want... I want to know what your experience was growing up cross-continental. How and when did you decide mm. that it was important for you to ensure, especially that Japanese culture is accurately represented in the media as well? So I really want to hear all that story. Oh, uh, well, first of all, I think to me, it was a very positive experience the whole time when even when I was living there as a kid I lived in Washington DC and Belgium and then Japan and but you were born I, in Japan right yeah I was born then, in Japan and you left when you were 14 no uh from two to five I was in Washington DC and oh. then nine to 12 I was in Brussels in Belgium wow. and then the rest of my life has been in Japan mm -hmm. so majority of my life has been in Japan it's actually now that I've lived in Vancouver for like 11 years uh 
Vancouver years is, is like creeping up to like me. I don't, I think, no, but I, still, I think I've lived in Japan more. Um, but yeah, so my dad was a journalist. So we traveled along with him. And mm. uh, it's interesting how I have two older siblings. I have a big brother and older sister. Um, pretty, We're pretty close uh, age wise. I, like my brother is four years older. My sister is a year and a half older. And it's interesting how like, even though our age is so close, we've had very different experiences. Yeah, I as... have the same with my two sisters. Totally different. Oh, amazing. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's, it's Explain really... that. Yeah, what explain. Are the, what are the differences? Um, do you want to go first, Christina? No, you go. This is your show. Oh, I'm gosh. just here for the... For the <laughs> it's your show, too. It's always yeah. your show. You know, it's... it's oh, make it. Please make it your show. <laughs> um, well, I... It, we were first in DC, so I learned English and Japanese kind of at the same time. So, cause you know, two year old, mm-hmm. you're just starting yeah. to speak language yeah. and words. So mm-hmm. it wasn't that hard to uh, adjust to American culture because I probably didn't even know this was America. You know, I just thought, oh, it's where my family is. Mm-hmm. And then outside, when I go to, uh, um, is it no kindergarten or preschool or what the, whatever, yeah, it, what daycare the or whatever it was, uh, I, everyone was speaking English. So I would speak in English and then at home it's in Japanese. So I remember my father telling me how me and my sister were, and my sister, I think had a, a kind of a similar experience to me, but she, um, she had a hard time a little bit later when I was in, when we were nine to 12 in Belgium, mm-hmm. but going back to the father thing, he mentioned how both of us at the beginning, we were doing, um, what do you call those? Like play, make believe playing. Like you're, you're like, um, cooking and, yeah. you know, all those things in Japanese. And then it started to become gibberish that sounded English, but it's still kind of Japanese. And then it started to be this, I don't even know what that language is gibberish. And then it started to be English. So he saw the transition of us, both of us kind of, but we, both of us, we always understood each other, no matter what language or, yeah, isn't that funny? It's funny how- That's so cool. (laughs) Yeah, it's interesting how uh, communication is not- it kind of just transcends and so but my brother he had he was already six when he moved to the states so mm-hmm. he had already made friends in japan and like spoke japanese and had an identity as a japanese boy so mm-hmm. um he doesn't talk much about it but he, i imagine or i heard how like there were some bullying and mm-hmm. uh racism and um but you know, you back in the days, especially in the, we address it more in the last five years, I think, yeah. in terms of uh, racism when you were a child. So mm. um, it was in, it was interesting to see how even now, mainly because I I've lived in North America for so long now that I think I speak English the best. But my sister can still. Uh, speak English very well because she she also lived in other countries and now she's living in San Jose but um, she's never lost the accent or like as in uh, she can always slip back into American accent but my brother for some reason it may be in a mental block I don't know but he has uh, an he has a Japanese accent when he was a kid he didn't but now as an adult he does so it's interesting how and with age is he in um, japan yeah okay so he's and he spent more to, he went back to japan and spent most of his time in japan then yeah yeah okay. yeah 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 right so it's very interesting how um language sticks with you and um but those are like small things from living abroad that uh that intersectional like experience like everybody even mm-hmm. within your family, the way you experience something is different. Totally. So I was always exposed to people being different, having different ideas, different perceptions, different experience. So um, 
being different or differences what never scared me or phased me because that, it was just normal i that love is, that right i was just in my in my mind i was like oh, the light bulb <laughs> i'm like because i have a lot of conversations and actually someone wrote off uh, a couple of people wrote on instagram um to us after there was one conversation that Raquel and I had about being transnational, about, you know, not being not quite one enough and not quite the other, especially for me, mm. um, you know, really dancing that line and being being mixed race. And and then there are so many different experiences surrounding that. But someone said to me the other day, they were like, thank you for voicing that. And I want to say thank you for voicing that as well, because whenever I have a perception of, uh, of someone disagreeing. I'm going to use mm. a very strong example here right now. Um, COVID, when people, anti-vaxxers, when mm. people are like, uh, this is what I feel and I really strongly feel this, I have felt some guilt about the fact that I don't that strongly feel. I, I have, I really don't like when people protest in a way that puts others in danger. Um, mm. And I, I have very strong opinions of what I believe is the right thing to do. But with people who are living out of fear or, you know, Raquel and I are both very similar where we're constantly like looking for the reasons why someone mm. feels that way. Mm -hmm. And I love that you just highlighted that that may well be because of by virtue of us growing up as transnational kids, moving country, having to assimilate, having to identify ourselves like through the noise. Um, and if you, the light bulb that came on for me was if you grow up with a family who have such vividly different experiences and you love your family and it doesn't break your family as it were, mm -hmm. then you learn to normalize that there are wildly different experiences and opinions existing within your nucleus. And if mm -hmm. that's the case, then you normalize that all the way out, right? And I never really thought about that. I was like, oh, well, why can't people just think blah, blah, blah. And mm. I have not grown up in, for example, like, what I hear about middle America, where there are a lot of people who have lived there for generations, who all are voting for the same people, watching the same channels, you know, they don't, they a don't. Homogenous, like ho super homogenous society. Yeah, I get, yeah, that's exactly how to say it. But yeah, I just wanted to highlight that because if any of you listening out there and watching this are kind of like, oh, that's an interesting, that's an interesting comment to make. Realizing that when you put people into your pocket of love that sounds bad um but <laughs> let's find another term for it when you put people into like your hug circle your of... love pocket <laughs> 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 when you poly pocket <laughs> when you poly pocket people uh and poly pocket oh that's, i love it <laughs> when you poly pocket people and you decide that they live in that world with you then you're, you know, you'd be, it's really important to have a lot of different people with a lot of different experiences in that poly pocket, because then you know that you love that person first as a foundation. And then you get to just curiously explore their differences. They, you mm. might not agree and it might be frustrating, but anyway, that's a sidebar, but I really wanted to highlight that. That's great. I'm also really curious how much your dad's career has to do with that. Like I imagine Ooh. being in journalism that you, that is what you do. You're, you're pulling out the differences. You're pulling out the stories. Like that is what you mm. do. And I know like when I grew up, my mom was very adamant that like difference is good. Don't go with the flow. Don't be a sheep. Like that was something she just always really pushed. So for me, I was very different, <laughs> and but I didn't was, feel like it was. Is uh, and very different, but I <laughs> special. But even when people didn't like it, and I was a kid, when you would think someone would be like, "Oh, I'm I have hurt feelings because I don't fit in with these kids," I didn't. I was like, "Nah, this is who I am, and too bad." And that was like five year old me. But okay. I wonder, like, if the journalism mm. does that in a way too, because that's I don't know. I think when you're storytelling, mm. that's what you're bringing out culture of storytelling interesting what did, what were you gonna say christina i was gonna say oh, see my amy should just be the host she's way better at this than me no <laughs> please <laughs> um but raquel i was gonna say because raquel you grew up with like a million animals and i also have an opinion that people... i didn't what i didn't oh. the animals didn't come till later so when i was when i was a kid um i mean we had a lot of cats at one point because we found homes for cat kittens um, but no, I actually grew up. 
every episode every episode she's like i did this in my life i was a diving instructor i was a martial arts expert and i'm like who are you what? incredible i'm not, I'm not. no <laughs> that or a liar <laughs> one day i'm gonna be like okay i'm testing everything you said you've done give me your gun <laughs> I, if my wallet's here, I can show you that one. Um, yeah, but no, uh, <laughs> but but I I do think it's a lot of the values, like every every family, and and I don't even think it's just families. To be honest, I think it's the people at your daycare, the people mm. who are teaching at the schools, the schools' values, because each mm -hmm. school system, like you go into one oh, school, 100%. And it's like. Right. And I think that filters down so much. And I think you're really lucky to have grown up embracing uniqueness. That's mm. such an amazing thing because I think some people, it takes them a lot longer to get to that point. Right. Mm. I think it was, and, and you made a really great point about school system. And mm. I think having gone through, uh, kindergarten or something in the states and then going back to japan to very homogenous very um every time there was when i go back there was definitely that first friction of like oh i need to assimilate i need to um the kind of a good thing and also a curse of like living so many in moving so many times is you get used to um adjusting and mm. it's a good thing, but at the same time, that's one of the reasons why, like, I totally had an identity crisis and, like, the loss of belonging and, like, feeling like nowhere feels like home and mm. um, connection to land. And like, that kind of formed in, in the last six, seven years living in Vancouver. So uh, I always felt like I was rootless. And um, the good thing is I can join a party and I'll have I'll, I know how to have fun I know how to connect with people because you know I'm just so used to, to it mm -hmm. yeah but then yeah. if I overstay I'm like wait aren't we moving what's happening and yeah. then I start to like wait is this okay why are we staying here so long I feel odd that I'm staying in one place I have to keep moving I'm the same I'm just I... hearing an echo from Christina I've literally oh, had this exact we have... I was like <laughs> It's so interesting, like that we've got yeah. to do another one, just a round table on moving because mm -hmm. yeah. I, every five years, like, so for context, for those of you who don't know me as well, um, I was born in Hong Kong, first 10 years of my life in Hong Kong, New Zealand for four and a half, Australia for seven. Um, wow. And these were like, so these are at, and then UK and then back to Hong Kong for a few years and then back to the UK, but London this time and then here. So I've lived for like, and when people are like, oh, but where are you really from? I'm like, I am from Hong Kong. And they're like, but where's home? And these questions, you've probably had them a lot before as well. And it's like, mm -hmm. I love that we've, my family, and I've moved more than all, than both of my siblings. I've moved more than anyone else in my family. Mm -hmm. um, it, oh, maybe not mom and dad. Um, but I realized when I spoke to mom about it, she was like, well, all of our family are, are people who have traveled. Like we've all been driven away of these country out of these countries by war right. so they fled um china when the japanese invaded they ch they fled india when the um when the indochina war happened you know and the the just it's all war laced mm -hmm. but for us i was like five years four years seven years like any time after five years i start to get really like oh no these people i'm starting to like know them deeper <laughs> than i'm used to and I can hold relationships with like my childhood friends um, at, that I've known since I was four, but I'm not in their daily lives. So navigating mm. how to operate. And when you say, Mayumi, you know, like you're used to being able to be in a room and get along with anyone, but to really understand another person and be able to like have a have a, that deep relationship with someone I think when I've seen people who've grown up in the same village and they're like yeah we've been friends forever I'm always envious in some ways mm -hmm. where I'm like oh you like know each is there's someone who knows you and has known you since you were a child you know right right <clears throat> although yeah, I have I one friend who is uh her name's kind of called name dropper but she <laughs> I've known her since I was 11 
Okay. So when I moved back to Japan and then we went to, we ended up going to the same junior high and high school. And then we've just been, I talk to her like every week, maybe almost every single day these days. Um, she got me hooked on BTS. Like she is, she is BTS is amazing. such amazing. Um, <laughs> But she, it's it's so nice to have someone that I we've known each other now for 23 years. Mm. Like, it's pretty incredible to have someone like that in your life. And I'd always wanted that. And now, like, because it's been, because I'm now in my mid thirties, now I have someone. But when I was a teenager, I was always like, oh, you've known each other since you were born. Or like, oh yeah, we went yeah. to the same kindergarten, preschool, mm. everything. And I was like, oh. That's yeah. nice. <laughs> it is. I I have to say I'm very lucky. Jilly was on the podcast, and one of my best friends, Christy Gregory, we've known each other since we were four. And oh wow, we st I still speak to Christy. Like the last couple months have been really. Uh, I've been a little bit hectic on my end, but Christy is like she's my, she's the person that can say something that I don't know. I'm going to be thinking or I don't know how I'm Ooh. acting or behaving and she'll be like do you think it's maybe this and I'll be like no it's so, I'm fine everything's fine she's like okay well and then like two <laughs> days later I'm like she, she was right <laughs> so she just she just knows like we just know yeah. we know four-year-old each other and then we've stayed at we haven't stopped being in touch but I don't get to see her on Friday I don't get to like I don't get to literally just sit there and put my head on her shoulder, you know? I miss that. I feel yeah. that, I feel that. And I am not transcontinental like you guys, but I did move a lot as well. It was all within Canada, but I moved, I think I went to four or five different schools and also oh, in different wow. uh, cities oftentimes. And then on top of that, it was before really the internet. So while it wasn't, mm. you know, into a different country, to me, it may as well have been because I didn't stay in touch with anybody. I didn't mm. really have a way. Well, I think maybe for like a month after the parents still were like inviting those kids over. And then after that, everyone just kind of forgets <laughs> unless things go. Yeah. But I also my best friend I've known since I was 12. And that is definitely like the longest friend that I'm still in touch with mm. but um i do i get that total envy too like especially when i see people from small towns i don't know why yeah. small towns seems to have it more than cities but i'm like man like really like they had like little dance lessons together and then they like yeah together and they know like everything i'm like wow like you're basically mm. like siblings like you just <laughs> yeah Totally. And there's a downside to it as well. Like I lived in a village for a while in England and it was like tiny, tiny village. Everyone knew everyone. And which also meant everyone knew everyone. So everything, <laughs> everything you did, like I was the only Asian in, they used to, cause it, at the time it wasn't rude uh, to say Oriental. And literally <laughs> I'd go into a pub and they'd be like, oh, you're that Oriental girl from the village. Oh, and I was like, oh my gosh. Oh. I don't mind the word, but I know that I know that it's ha it has other connotations. But it was never in a rude way, never. Like just to be really, really clear, it was just like this is how I'm identifying you. And I was like, I'm not Asian <laughs> enough to be so Asian odd. in Hong Kong, but I'm the only Asian in the village in this tiny village in England. Yeah, it was so weird. But they they really got into each other's like gossip, and there's you know there's right. those downsides. But I want to go back to the identity piece, um, Mayumi, because I. Mm -hmm. I know I want to hear more and I'd love for you to explain to people what a cultural consultant is. But first, I want to ask you, you know, this, the the identity piece, the belonging, the feeling rootless. Is that what kind of drove you to tell more Asian and specifically Japanese mm -hmm. stories and like mm. and, and, and to ensure that it's accurately represented? Because that's a very niche thing that you do. Right. Um, so was that was it a part of the belonging? You know, at the beginning, I had no idea. Mm. At the beginning, it was really just, what do I want to write about? Or what, mm. what story am I attracted to? Mm -hmm. And then I just followed that gut and then went with it. And then as I started making shorts, like maybe three or four shorts, and I started to see the, not the pattern, but like the themes that I, um, that I lean on quite a lot. And I realized that, oh, that's what a voice is, like what my um, cinematic 
voice is like mm. what are as a storyteller these are the themes that I like to tackle like if you look at like Koreeda and like um Bond and Ho and all these people they have in their writing they have some sort of like there's some cohesive something that we can tell that oh it's it's that director's work yeah not just yeah. visually but like in the storytelling and um I realized pretty soon well I don't know if it's soon what three four maybe even two I don't know um that oh, I really am attracted to story about belonging and identity in search of identity mm. because um, I always feel, I always feel and felt sandwiched between North, North, <laughs> East and West mm -hmm. and e even between age or like, um, yeah, I, again, we were talking about differences and I always felt like I was seeing like two polar different things and that I'd be like, hmm, I feel like they're wanting the same thing but can't see this similarity um yeah so is that so when you do you did you start as an actor yes okay so you what what was that epiphany for you because I don't know about you and I don't want to also don't want to stereotype but coming from Hong Kong another Asian country um being an actor or a performer is not regarded in the same way as it is in terms of mm. a career path, right? Mm -hmm. So it can be, when I was growing up, it was not a very supported career. Yeah. Um, and it still isn't in Hong Kong. There's still, you know, there's not, it, it doesn't garner the same respect as being a doctor, a lawyer, an accountant. Mm -hmm. So how did you find out that's what you wanted to do? And then how, how, were your, how were your family, how were your closest people around supporting that? I, I think I, it ignited in junior high, high school when I was in a drama club for like six years. Okay. And it was a very intense drama club. Like we were very serious about what we were doing. Okay. And it was Just also- Just imagine little Miami that's like, I'm oh. going to super act. <laughs> <laughs> so serious. And, and also they had such strict rules. Like uh, it was very, um, what is the word? Like- the senpai kohai which is like the el elders the seniors and then the younger students the relationship was very hier hierarchical hierarchical yeah hi yeah hierarchical. hierarchical oh my goodness that's such a hard word <laughs> say that ten um, times <laughs> <laughs> they so we had to like open doors for them and we couldn't lean on one foot if they weren't or we couldn't um wow sit. uh we'd always have to like sit with our knee with our legs tucked in uh, and we can we couldn't lean and sit unless the the seniors did it. Like it was very wow. very. Strict. This was in Japan. Yeah, this was yeah. in junior high and high school. Okay. So uh, again, it was very serious. Um, but I th maybe because of the seriousness, like they really tried to do a lot of great works and you and used a lot of scripts materials that were done in contemporary Japanese theater. So. Uh, through that I got introduced to theater and I really loved acting and I did I also loved directing because we also we all direct our own stuff <clears throat> but um obviously we thought obviously it feels like that is an impossible dream because I think we all know that in Asia beauty standards are insanely high and I I I am just not maybe like plus three average kind of look like it's really like I just did not cut the classic beauty standard of Japan body wise face like everything so I it's not like I had insane talent in singing and dancing so it took a lot of convincing for me as well that like do I really want to do acting and for me saying that I want to be an actor does that make other people think that like wow does she think she's so special like all these things I just kept thinking like do but I like it because I enjoy it I really love acting that's why I want to do it so I did a lot of um <clears throat> small theater in Japan while I was in university but I still took the university route and like actually went to a four-year university so that my parents would be like you have to go to university you can't just be an actor they didn't say that but 
that's just the social norm. Yeah. So uh, I did that. But while I was in school, I did so many plays and they would all come see it. And I think gradually they realized like, okay, she's not that bad. <laughs> she's not that bad. She's not that bad. And also like, okay. That's well, a compliment. <laughs> Nation she really culture. loves it. Then like, uh, and then luckily I had, I had, I have two older siblings who took the traditional route of went to university got into a reputable company and then you know earned a living and all that stuff so took the pressure off you (laughs) exactly so they were sort of like okay third one just let them do whatever they want kind of thing and um so they were supportive in the sense that like they weren't like here let's all get all these opportunities it was more like try it go for it and then you know see how it goes um, but they they supported me uh, financially and, and all, all, all these things. It was very, I was so fortunate that um, when I made, and even going to Canada was, my dad was the one who brought the brochure back from Vancouver, his like business trip to Vancouver. He was like, I mean, if you're going to do this seriously, like why not use the fact that you can speak English fluently? Mm. Because the biggest dream I think was to work in Hollywood to work in North American productions because I watched Grey's Anatomy and Ally McBeal and Heroes and I just and talking about the yeah but Heroes was one of those things when I watched it um Masioka was huge and I saw this another actress who was in the series who was Japanese and she was um uh and they spoke Japanese in that show quite a lot yeah I loved that show yeah it was so fun but then some of the actors weren't fluent in Japanese so I felt like oh I want to go and I want to play because I'm fluent in both languages Mm -hmm. like maybe there's a shot but then of course it just feels impossible and then my dad brought back the brochure so I looked at it and was like and they had a a one-week summer intensive at Vancouver Film School and I thought and, and just at that time the same time I was in this um talent agency in Japan for film and TV. I had just started that and I really didn't like it. I hated how it was so superficial. Literally, I was told to go uh, go to this, I guess, go to drinks with these producers and directors so I can serve them drinks and smile. That was how oh. I could get jobs. And what? Yeah. That was here. No, 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 in Japan. No. Oh, okay, Japan. sorry, 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 right, right, right. Yeah, when I was in the talent agency in Tokyo. And they would, you know, they would say stuff like, I mean, and they were like, uh, yeah, if you lost my like 20 pounds, then maybe oh. you can do this. And then I, I did, I, do, I did do that in a month. And then, and it in a really- month, You lost 20 pounds in a month. Yeah, because I felt so pressured and I did it. And I, looking back, I was really not happy. And then I started to not enjoy acting, mm. the acting classes and the, the singing classes, all of that just felt so um, disingenuous and felt, I felt like, what am I striving towards? And I, I don't, I'm not wanting to be famous. I just want to act. I just want to work with really cool actors and directors. And I just felt like that path was paved with so many fake smiles, body image, and nothing related to acting. And so I started to hate acting and I was like, oh, that's strange. I came in wanting to do more acting and then now I hate acting. And then, so this one week intensive thing came and then I was like, maybe if it's one week, they won't find out how bad I am. So (laughs) I I went uh, and my mom loves traveling. So we went together. And she she just enjoyed Vancouver for a week, but she was also there for my emotional support. But um, I was there for a week to do the course and it opened my eyes to um, just being able to call yourself an artist as an actor. Because like you said, Christina, it comes with so much shame and guilt when you're trying to pursue that career in Asia. Yeah, and it can be outside of Asia as well. It's, yeah, you know, some totally. people who, it, this is why, you know, Raquel and I have these conversations all the time, and especially me. And one of the things that you and I spoke about at Coffee was 
glamorizing what's on the other side of the lens mm. because there are so many things that you can do um and if no and no one knows about them and so they think oh you're an actor or you work in entertainment have i seen you in anything like how many times have you heard that sentence like oh what are you in as if that is the golden egg you know being the lead in the film is mm -hmm. the thing that gives you the most i suppose hierarchical respect and the reality is that is only true because of how Hollywood and other systems have glamorized those lead roles. Mm. And it wasn't until I went, I went to theater school where someone actually looked at me and I was like, oh, you know, I've always wanted to be a lead, but I'll never be the lead. And I think it might've been my, my drama teacher, my um, Sue Rassi, who terrifies me to this day, but one of the most <laughs> brilliant women in the world. Uh, and she looked at me and she was, I think it was her that, or someone else that like her that said, do you really want to be that lead in that romantic comedy? The villain is so much more interesting. Mm. And I stopped <clears throat> for the first time and I was like, actually gonna read all the bad guy scripts. And I looked back over my childhood and was like, I always wanted to be either the comic relief, like uh, like the genie, I, when people were like, who do you wanna be? Like Aladdin's your favorite you know disney show and i was and they were like who would you be of course you'd be and i was like the genie yes <laughs> that is though i'd learned all of those words but my point is if you're not we're taught to participate with the goal of being that lead person instead of being like actually breaking down what's the most interesting thing to you what phase of your career are you in what can you do at the same time what is going to mm. help you inform the other parts of your career um and i wanted to go into the cultural consultancy thing because until you mentioned it i had no idea what that was and i don't think any of any of the people listening may know what that is mm. so um and it depends on the production mm. and i think it's increasing more because of thankfully for the demand of authenticity mm -hmm. and um because you know before it, it there I don't I don't know if that position even existed or maybe it did but they only had like a, a very small amount of um say mm -hmm. uh and ultimately it is um uh, the decision is all it's always down to the director and the producers like we were not the creators but um, in the past few years, it's been so amazing to see how the product, so many productions are, they're willing to, um, or, or they, they want to uh, see how, how authentic and accurate they can be as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and some productions like 100%, everything someone flags, it's like, okay, let's consider that, let's look into that and actually take time and spend money on um making it right and and that really i think it speaks to uh the activism of like everybody who has been voicing the inaccuracy of the portrayal of these cultures and um in a way that's i'm 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 grateful for social media that you know we've shed light on how um as a community when you stand together it's very very strong Mm -hmm. And uh, we're all sort of holding ourselves accountable. And that's, that's really powerful to see how like, um, I think it, it's obviously it's very hard when you're one person on set. Yeah, trying to say that, like, no, this isn't how you do it. Or like, you shouldn't be doing this. And like, yeah, but this is your production. And like, not that I've had yeah. that experience. But Luckily, um, most of the shows that I've been on, it's they've been so open to it. And um, and the directors are always kind of uh, cure they're, and really great directors are sort of finding the value in authenticity, mm. seeing that um, there's actually more richness in bringing in diversity and, and authenticity. So and I, I see that as um, I think that's why uh, all of my work has uh, a person of color or likes, or or just, I, I try to not make it so too homogenous um, as much as like Akashi is, is homogenous, but um, the influence of many different cultures, I think is, is part of what made Akashi. 
and uh, and even other films that I've made. I feel like it's always interesting to see how maybe because of how I grew up, it's interesting to see how different cultures mixing together and then finding a universal truth together. Um, what was I talking about? Oh yeah, so cultural consulting. What basically what I do is, um, if I break it down, like I would get called in to uh, look at the script and then look through the script, see if there's anything that feels inauthentic or um, maybe even offensive. And then talk about that with the director, the writer, the producers and flag it. And then if they're really um, wanting me to be involved in depth, then I look at every single draft outline stage and then um, even the cuts. Um, yeah, yeah. And then sometimes so cool. creative meetings about things that they're designing and creating. So it's it's been a really, really great opportunity for me to learn so much about um, writing, directing and show running and producing from a creator's standpoint. So it's kind of been, I've never been to film school. So this has really been my way of learning about filmmaking. And for someone who doesn't understand why are the details important? Like why are the small things important to both the story, but also to honoring the culture and all of that? What does that bring forth in, in media? I think there's several things. One of the things is when, uh, especially now that all these content is like, it's global, it gets shown all over the world. So uh, it's most likely gonna be watched by that, that community from that culture. So mm -hmm. when they're watching it and if they're taken out of the story because of the inaccuracy, then it's kind of doing disservice to the story and they feel like they're too distracted that like oh my god this person is eating that thing that way I can't even believe that they're Japanese anymore so it takes you yeah. out instantly yeah. um and that's kind of the same with like you know when you're even watching accents in English and then you're like oh my gosh that British accent is <laughs> awful like it's the same thing you just you want to make sure that it's seamless so that everybody can fully believe in the make-believe world it's all a lie already we all know that but yeah. it's just how much you can you know make sure that everybody is buying into everything and because it's shown all over the world, now we're gonna we're paying a closer attention to really getting it accurate. Um, that's I think that's one thing. And then another thing I think is, um, I think there's something about if you're portraying a different culture, there's some there the richness of culture just brings so much more to story, I think, and not sort of like giving it a, a blanket, gen generalizing culture because when you get more specific and detailed, you'll realize how interesting and layered and deep everything is. Um, let's say uh, the color choices of a wardrobe, like this person wearing this color in this occasion, that mm -hmm. actually means this in this culture. And so that would be, that would be found offensive. And if it is, then if you're gonna incorporate that, then everybody around them should look at them that like, oh my gosh, what is yes. that person doing? And that like little detail, again, makes us believe that like, oh, I know that I've seen that or like I've felt that. And again, that inaccuracy will um, take it away from the audience, but then it adds another layer of storytelling to what is written on the script. And so and I think it just like adds learning. richness. Yeah, yeah, because people learn from media all the time. Like, all think the about time. How much we take away, yeah. and if it's inaccurate, you're like, God forbid, you're traveling to a country, and you're like, well, in this movie, they were wearing this lovely dress of this color, and all of a sudden, you find out that white's a funeral color, and you're like, oh, this was yeah. a terrible decision. Yeah. I hate that movie now. <laughs> I you took honestly, you took the thought out of my brain, Raquel. That's exactly what I was thinking. Is that there is it. <laughs> When you, I don't know about where you grew up in both of your various places, but I, when I lived in London, I used to love going to the National Gallery mm. and seeing 
the incredible pieces of art that they would select a few of and would host free walking tours. And they would talk about the art and I used to love, love it because I could go and stare at a piece of art and never know the layers of that story. Mm. And then when they would break it down from, and I'd be like, oh, well, this is an interesting thing. And I, something would pique my interest. And I'd be like, but why, did, why does this look like this? And they would be like, well, actually at the time, this is what was happening. This is what was going on. These only these instruments were available for creating mm. the story. And you get such a rich, you said it so well, Mayim, you get such a rich, layer which i think is really the true celebration of humanity in our visual storytelling mm -hmm. because that it just it it it's a it's a lattice work of of story and the deeper yes. you get the literally the richer it is and when you see these pieces of art that have so much to it that people can pour over it for years and years and keep discovering and keep un unmasking these elements um it really feeds it really feeds us and our our humanity and our interconnectivity and our understanding of our differences from a place Absolutely. of curiosity yeah. instead of a place of like this is what it is oh when i go to japan i i do this thing i'll bow and like there's no other context there's no other yeah there's no other story yeah around. i mean if you i have a good example if you take mm. it like um my short Akashi has a cab scene. So the cab driver's set design and his wardrobe was we paid extra attention because it's so different from North American cabs. When you go to Japan, the door opens automatically. First off, you don't even touch the door when you enter. And then you step in. Most of these cabs have a, a, a lace sheet or some sort of sheet cover that makes it look a little more executive. And then when you look at the driver, most of them are wearing like vest and a tie and they usually have like white gloves and like, it's very official, even if it's just a normal cab. Wow. So, and the way they would, in some of these cab drivers who have done it like 30 something years, they have like these mannerisms and like, and the way they would like steer the wheel and like talk to these customers, it's very, specific and it's in you if you break it down it's it comes down to how they what how they perceive customer service and that also comes down to the culture and mm -hmm. how, how you communicate with others mm -hmm. and if the story is about communication and lack of communication then how awesome is it to include that part of culture to see how like this one person has lost touch of themselves and lost touch of their own culture. And she goes into this cab and this cab driver is like everything about that culture. And he is very uh, good at communicating because this is every day he communicates. So the juxtaposition within that cab was something that I was really interested in and the set deck does it does a lot of the storytelling for us and not and and the wardrobe adding to the amazing performance of Hiro Kanagawa mm. so I think if we uh um disregard those things I think it we're losing an opportunity yeah it's great opportunity to just make it even more richer mm -hmm. and um add more context and i think as an actor i love it when these like props or set decks are like so perfect when i was doing the man on high castle everything was pristine everything like even a bottle of beer had some like story like, yeah everything so it gives you a better context of the world and okay how how do i walk how do i breathe in this space mm. how does how is my posture like all of the, how do what are the sounds of my heels on this tiles and like all these very specific things becomes part of the creative journey so the process mm. and uh i think as a creator i feel like people are noticing more and more how getting it authentic and it, it's not just about um making sure we won't that people won't throw them under the bus <laughs> or like people yeah. won't be like oh I saw this and go on Twitter I think we, I'm glad that people are noticing more and more and I make I make sure when I bring it up to producers and directors that it's 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 a creative um 
it's it's uh it's a bonus creatively to do it this way mm-hmm. because of this 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 it's so inspiring to use it in the that language as well because i think the other side of that coin is that I really honestly believe that authentic storytelling prevents racism and promotes inclusion. And I think, and and I really think that as we have been, uh, you know, had travel taken away from us for the last two years, for the most mm. part, as we are starting to realize that we're very connected in some ways and very disconnected in others, the ways that we do connect and the stories that we do tell have in and of themselves a responsibility to be more authentic because we yeah. can't get to those places and absorb some of those things. We are in the safety of our living rooms, many of us who are very privileged to be there, to do that. Um, and we can watch, we can watch TV shows, we can live vicariously, we can experience emotions and creating opportunity for people to be better represented in terms of more authentically represented um, for, and I know you're a big a big advocate of, of greater representation in Asian storytelling and the Asian diaspora, which to me, I think I'm growing as I grow, I grow more and more towards the diaspora, um, just because I think there is such a huge Asian community here that mm-hmm. you know we've been stereotyped a lot and those of us in the middle as well have been kind of pushed into both sides. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's just so important to come at it from an inspiring perspective where you're like, here yeah. is how I'm here is how the story is going to be even more exciting. And you can and now I've taught you something, yeah. you know, I've taught you something about and and in, in a way that you get to have a piece of that culture, too. Yeah, it doesn't mean that you get to claim it or own it, but you get to know it. And knowing is the first part of really accepting and then embracing that with other people the exchange with others yeah i always tell them at the beginning that i don't want to police Mm -hmm. i don't i'm not here to police you and i'm not interested in that Mm -hmm. i always want to make it better by making it authentic Mm -hmm. so um so they're not feeling like oh my god mayumi said no so i guess we can't do that you know (laughs) it's not i'm not saying no because you can't do it i'm saying that if this, that this is the effect that it will have when yeah. that happens. Now here's so, your choice. Yeah, it is their choice. It's also a very good persuasive tactic, just FYI. <laughs> See, she <laughs> is just waiting in the background <laughs> <sighs> to be like, yes, by Meet the way. Meet them where they can agree. That is how you create change. Just if is anyone this- is trying to create change. <laughs> Yeah. I am now looking back to every conversation we have had recently about everything that jars me. Like, oh, hey, we're doing much now. Oh, hey, we're going to do retreats now. Oh, hey, we're going to do this thing now. And I'm like, no, we're not. And then all of a sudden I'm like, hey, apparently we're doing retreats and you should be really excited about this. <laughs> we're all doing Monster. it. It's amazing. Um, but I want to know about you. I mean, you've done in the bio, we're talking about like all of these incredible things that you're doing so you have the tiff netflix accelerator program there's the access writers program the director's chair chair career advancement module like what how do you find these how, mm. where are they how do you find them how, great like these question incredible oh, well um i had that question for the longest time like <laughs> why is everybody getting into this? Why am I not in yeah. this? How do yeah. I get in this? Like that was a big question for the longest time. And then um, and then I got bitter because of FOMO. And then I was like, ha, fuck this. So I, I'm out and swear. I don't know. Yeah, again. Okay. yeah do it. <laughs> and then I felt even more shitty feeling like, oh, I'm just not applying. What am I being bitter about? I can't even, I shouldn't even complain when I haven't even put myself out there. So um I actually made the effort to look up like talent programs and, uh, but first of all, it's just knowing that it exists. So and one of the reasons why I put it out there that I am in it is so that people can see that this exists. And then yeah. if I can get it, you for sure can get in so that people can feel Not like, true. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely true. So um, they can be like, oh, okay, well then maybe when it's the application time, I'll put it in. And I always miss deadlines. I am queen missing deadlines. <laughs> so um, somehow I didn't miss some of these deadlines. And truth is most of them, 
uh, I found out three days or two days before some just one day before. Wow. And so literally it's just pulling it all together and whipping it up. And then it's good that you, if, and the good thing is if you've applied to one of them, you can kind of like modify it. So Rejig it. it. <laughs> yeah, 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 really. And then apply again, because you're most likely applying with the same project that you're still working on mm-hmm. and polishing. So it does get easier once you start applying, but it does, it's the first like, okay, let's get all the material together yeah, and uh, just put that in that Google drive so that it's easy to access and then pull it together and then just send it. And I want to just jump in there because I think like there are a lot of collectives for entrepreneurs, for people who are running their own businesses. Raquel and I have been exploring a lot with our publicist. Um, Shout out Crystal Richard. She's the best. Um, (laughs) But we've been talking about all these different opportunities. Right. And I think Mm. as you know, all three of us are women sitting here at the table. So, you know, there are awards for for different people to get mentorship to get further forward but like you said even outside of the creative industries like you need to get have all your things together like Raquel and I spent a lot of time being like who are we what do we do what do we believe in and we continually challenge that Mm -hmm. Um, and I think uh, I just want to go back as well to the point you made about anyone can get in I think anyone can apply and when I speak to people and coach people and mentorships and grants Sometimes there are some grants that just aren't meant for you, but every mm. single one is going to get you closer to the one that is. And 100%. I think that's what I what I want for people to understand so much is when when I have a lot of these conversations and people are like, yeah, but I've been applying for so much. I've been applying for grants and I never get any of them. And I'm like, let's actually break down what you've done. You've created a press kit. You've created all these things. Maybe your world is like not public funding maybe you need to take this to a private investor and they're like oh and i was like and then you don't have to report and then you don't have to do these things and Mm. once they've built that and they've taken that first step to move towards something that momentum really helps if they know that they're not attached to the outcome and i love that sometimes you were applying the day before two days before because that most most times Oh, you and me both. Uh, but, but when you do, when you know about them and then you share them with others, like again, that's something you and I really, I think we have in common is that it is greater when we're together putting these things out there so that the more people can subscribe to these programs and try, and I know from a government perspective, if they are reported to and said, hey, we ran this program and we had like 28 applicants, that government funding body is not always, but likely going to turn around and say, well, then there's not a need. Mm. And I don't think people understand that. Whereas if you apply for something, you're helping yourself, you're showing it's important and you, and that you can do something with that funding. Yeah. You know, and you'd be surprised. I've been on juries for things now and Mm. I'd be, you'd be surprised how, these juries or the people who are making the decisions are overlapping. So oh, yeah, if they been see on them too. like, yeah, if they see like, oh, but I saw this person's this project yes. on this one and we couldn't get this person in, mm-hmm. can we please give this person a go on this one? And they've been, I've seen this application the last three ones and like, they're really going for it. I just want to like give it a chance and like it happens. So, and it I does. think the key thing is uh, the more, the more you apply, of course you, and every time you apply, you polish it, whether that's your lookbook or even if it's your headshot or your bio, whatever it is, you polish it. And the more you polish it, it gets better and better and better. And in, I think I've been lucky to have friends and my partner kind of looking over it to, um, I think we can actually, you know, three months ago, it looked good, but now I look at it, I feel like we can do this and make it better. Mm. And then um, it just, looks better and better and better so there's that and then the more they ask you questions about why you why now it gives me a perspective of like actually why why me why now yeah and the more you hone that down it's easier for you to pitch yourself to other people it's not so much like which i still sometimes (laughs) have japanese gibberish (laughs) but it's when you start to write these things, 
you uh you're kind of putting words in your mouth <laughs> like yeah 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 i yeah. am that i for sure i i, I did that and, like, you, and with then that you realize face, please with yeah, that face every time that. Like, yeah 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 Sure. Yeah, I, that, yeah, that's yeah, me. I, totally I, I won that award. Yeah, no. I forgot about that <laughs> in the last two years, but I totally did. You know, it's <laughs> and then you can remind yourself. And the next time you actually have a meeting or like when you have to pitch in front of someone, it's it's it becomes a little bit more easier to mm. uh, talk about yourself because that that was also a struggle for me to like sell myself. And I was like, oh, I don't know how to do that, and that's gross and blah blah blah. But um. I've learned from, and even from these talent programs that you're not selling yourself. You're just showing up with the version that you want them to perceive so that um, whatever it is, the project you want to do, it gets greenlit. And then the story or the, the work can speak for you. But until then, they need to believe in you. Mm-hmm. And they don't know the history of your 30 something years. Mm-hmm. They, they don't know that. So they need to find you out in the, in the first three minutes. So it's not just about credentials. Credentials are easy so that it, 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 it's easy for them to be like, oh, TIFF, oh, Netflix, oh, mm. women under it. Okay. I know people who went through that. So it's, it's contextualizing that for them, but then adding the spice of you. So it's like, but actually I'm really interested in intersectional like, or like intergenerational or um, perspective of the, of the in-between themes of belonging. All these things are very me. And then I can talk about like three continents that I've lived in and the activism that I do, whether it's on social media and whatnot. And then, and then they're like, oh, right. It's that girl who is like, who hates body shaming. Or like, oh yeah, it's that girl who, um, said uh telefilm why don't you change the language description or like language requirement oh yeah it's mm-hmm. that girl so it's not there's so many filmmakers but there's only one you and usually you start to sort of feel like how can i stand out and you think that i gotta make the project really good raquel's but, just like <laughs> but it's no, also about understanding <laughs> understanding yourself you're killing me because this is so so perfect for people who are trying to look for jobs, for people who have businesses, Mm. this transfers, everything that you're saying is so perfect. Like even if you look at social media and if you look at branding, it's exactly what you're talking about. So you're trying to hone your story and then you're trying to tell it over and over and over again Mm -hmm. so that people can look at it and they can say, oh, actually I can see that there's this whole resume where they've been doing this for the last three years. I can tell that this is actually who they are. Yeah. And everything that you're saying, like every time you do it, you're honing it, you're making it better. You just have to start and you have to put it out there and iterate, which is something I'm very bad at, but definitely learning and getting you're better at it. But you're doing a good job. <laughs> Don't worry. You're doing it's better when it's not about me. It's, it's better, like, I can do it yeah. with brands, but when it's me, I'm like, it's oh, hard. like, resumes and, but, and LinkedIn's and... <laughs> but that brings us to the team side of things, right? Like, Mayumi, yes. you have an amazing team of people. And when I say team, I, I kind of use that term loosely because I don't know who your actual team is. But I mean the people who come together and operate at your level and know your values so well and align with them. Mm-hmm. And I think when that happens, you know, for with Raquel, like we've had this conversation where you're like, I have to do a bio. And I was like, I'll just do it. And I'll just do it yeah. for you because I know. And it's that- fabulous. And I'm like, wait, that is me. I'm like, I'm like me, you, me. I'm like, that's me. I did what oh, that well, we were doing. Yeah, I did it. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is when you have a team of people, you, you, in some ways you create a common cause that is greater than you. And I think bombshell. And then what you can do is retrospectively come back and, and, and quietly acknowledge your achievements, but they permeate into your pre- your pitches, your presentations, your deck, whatever it is that you're putting towards someone else, because mm-hmm. then it doesn't become a show. It becomes a fact and it becomes something that you are proud of and honor. And, it, and that I think is when I do a lot of coaching on resumes, it's the biggest thing where I'm like, if you are worried about whether someone thinks that you're trying to like big yourself up, Let's just break it down to the actual facts. If you were, um, you know, you worked in a restaurant, most people will be like, I worked in a restaurant. 
um, for five years. And they're like, you know, I worked at, you know, I don't know, Tom's Diner for five years. Uh, <laughs> just a reference, music industry reference. Anyway, um, but I worked at this diner and I turn around and say, okay, but how many sh shifts did you do a week? How many employees were there? Did you do any staff training or something that was logged? Do you, how many tables would you serve in a night? How much cash were you responsible for handling? And they'd be like, oh, well actually like $30,000. And like, actually the diner was like three levels. And actually I did train other people. Those, when you take outside, take things out of um, subjectivity and you make it numeric or as close to objective as possible, mm. you're then placing <clears throat> that on a piece of paper and just leaving it there. And then on the other side of it, yes. you have this team of other people who are by virtue of relationship with you and their own values that align with you authenticating that mm. objectivity. So you have people in your film, Miami, and and even, you know, the events that we go to, I'll be honest, they're not in, not everyone gets into those events. Those are people who are hustling, who are proud mm. of what they do, and who operate at a very high standard of commitment. That's just the reality for most for the, most of what we do, I would say. So by association, it's so important to make sure that you do have a team so that one, you can say something like Raquel, I need a bio. Two, you can break things down with your team and, and have someone else extract information when you're not in a position to necessarily do it. And three, you can rely on that group of people to help bring that cause into the next phase, which right. I think you do exceptionally well. I don't know if I... Um... I, I don't, I thank you. <laughs> I don't know, but I, I think I want to say one thing about like bios and um, resumes that, because I definitely had this feeling like, like, oh, is this like too, like, mm, I'm so, ooh. But then I realized how cool it is when, because I'm not, I'm, I'm not what, when you just look at the resume or the bio, it's like, whoa, like, oh, wow. But then when you meet me, I'm not that. I'm a, I'm such a fucking dork. Like I don't, <laughs> I'm a, I'm a hot mess. So I don't. Best hot mess. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> I don't okay. have my shit together. I don't, I don't walk around saying I'm a little bored with an actress. See how I just pulled this and I just almost <laughs> strangled myself. That's my life. So, but I think that's, I just think that's more real that like, yeah, yeah. the achievements and what the programs I got in is that is also real, but that's not to me very important. It's, it's important to some people for decision makers who need credentials and whatever it is. But the most important thing is that they get to know me, who I am, who is the real me, who is uh, so, um, but then when it's time to work, I'll do the work, but mm -hmm. off that I'm very like, ba -ba -ba -ba, like, I don't really, so, um, but I think that's, that, that, that took off the risk, the, the stress of me having to prove myself in the moment. I can still, I can be more me and just be whatever mm. when the 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 important informations are already on there i don't have to talk about it yeah because i don't want to talk about it either i would just talk about like the talking about you know belongings and the, the struggles and like those are really interesting like human talks that i'd love to get into and learn about others mm -hmm. not so much me about oh when i won this award like it's you know <laughs> but i so, think that's what allows them to give you that space to do it that's yes. what I'm saying is that yeah, when you get exactly. into you, you go for those awards, you go for those things because people who don't know you need a metric. They yeah. need to understand who you are in the scope it's of, part the, of world. the biz. Yeah. It's part of mm -hmm. every biz. It's every yeah, single yeah. business. It's like, it's getting your MBA. It's deciding to go back to school and, and find ways to like Absolutely. Professor Xavier me while I'm not looking Raquel. <laughs> it's finding ways to like, to really push yourself forward professionally and understand that once you get those things, as you're going for those things, you can become more you because you have that undeniable, I, I call it that resolution, right? That's like, well, this just is, it isn't, doesn't have anything to do with my emotions or what I believe in. It just is. And then these things are like, here's all the things I believe in. Cause 
that's how people that's investment right we live in a capitalistic society that's currently what the structure is and as we right. shift into different currencies which i'm i say i'm now going to normalize just saying that so that it's like a typical thing that we now think about our cultural currencies our social currency our creative currency as well as financial monetary currency that we use on a daily basis i think that is part of what we have to understand in terms of the game that we're playing so we need enough to be like hey i don't need to prove myself now let me tell you what I believe in. Mm -hmm. And I, I think this is what I loved about looking at just your bio, your credentials, what you've done. You have enough on it that someone could not know you at all and go, oh, this person seems really interesting and, and accomplished. And then go to your social media and say, and I can see how much she believes in all of these things that she's doing. That oh, is authentic cool. storytelling. Well, I mean, I see, I follow you. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, it, it makes so funny it makes so much sense and i think you and i talk about f juggling all of the things in our career because we just love doing all of them in front of and behind the lens and i think that's something that i really i really admire and i think that mm. we we love to normalize for other people to be able to do and raquel and i that's part of why this show exists is so that we can say hey we're not all like glamazons like being a glamazon also means my hair like sometimes does this weird thing where just a little piece of it comes out and <laughs> one time it went out this way but it's fine that's part of what makes us who we are yeah yeah exactly oh, uh, well this, this is, is amazing yeah. <laughs> this is so good i feel like okay one last question because i know we're like running out of time here but super quickly um you've built some amazing teams with the projects that you've been working on what are your tips for bringing on people that share your values or the project's values? Show yourself. Mm. Mm. You reveal yourself completely and then determine if they like you, <laughs> if they buy into that. If they're stoked about who you are as you, uh, same with the project if you reveal all of it and then you put it out there I always see if they if that resonates with them personally or if I if me being me is okay with them mm. and then a lot of things become easy I think whether that's like if I'm stressed out and then I need to talk to them it's easier to open up and I feel I trust that people are mirrors so when you do that oftentimes people will do that to you as well and mm. occasionally sometimes you find out that that person the person is not capable of doing that and um and it's unfortunate when you find that out later and that that happens but um the more you reveal yourself the more you are vulnerable the more you show yourself I think uh, especially as a director, if you are leading the project, um, I don't, I don't think, uh, anything has to be in a mist. Like, I think it should be, everything should be demystified and like how, like, oh, I'm not, I'm, I'm actually this part of the script. I'm not quite sure. Even with the actors, like just openly talk about that. What do you think about that part? Like, I'm, it's not really sitting with me yet, but like, how are you feeling about it? And uh, you know, I just, communication is really important, but communication with you being fully open to uh, reveal yourself will, I think, attract the right people for you. I love that. Oh, you're so great. <laughs> you're amazing. I think you should be in persuasive communications because I could tell you some theories that that falls right into. But anyway, <laughs> but not not while I'm in the room because apparently I'm the guinea pig for everything. <laughs> I'm I'm so bad with any school. I still have nightmares of um, not being able to pass my last exam for university and then having to tell my mother that I'm doing one more year with university. I still Aww. I still have nightmares. Oh, That's how much I hated school. Wow. And I did very poorly in school. Very poorly. So I'm surprised how like I am. I am You've able been to successful. <laughs> no, not successful, but just Rates being don't able mean to, anything. <laughs> just being able to like live in a place. Like I'm, just I'm like, sure when I was survive. 
<laughs> yeah, just survive, literally. I think when I just looked at the score when I was in high school and university, I would just be like, how will I ever contribute to society? Like, How will I ever be any sort of a Barrett to anybody? Because numbers did not tell me that. Um, but I'm glad I didn't value those numbers. Yeah, and so are we, no. and so is the world. So is the world. Yeah. It all comes <sighs> down to what you love. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, Mayumi, thank you so much. That was absolutely incredible. Uh, I can't wait to see you again. We'll have coffee soon. And yes. uh, Zoom Raquel in for a hi. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> this was amazing. Thank you, thank you, you two, for holding these and holding the space to, for these conversations. Oh, so, the pleasure is you. ours. Um, I was going to say, are you kidding? We're just sitting here <laughs> learning every time. We're just like these <laughs> this is entirely sponges. selfish. <laughs> yeah. It's great. But I mean, you're welcome. You're so yeah. welcome. <laughs> we, like to, we like to serve and please. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. We will talk to you soon. Mayumi Yoshida, thank you so much again. Thank you. Thanks for listening, Bombshells. In order to continue to elevate, subscribe and don't forget to click that little bell so you can get notified every time we have a new badass brunch. Until next time, stay focused, fierce and fabulous.